Hey everybody, Eric Grenier here and welcome to the 39th episode of the RIT podcast. So last week we saw the first budget from the Liberal government since the last election and the first budget since they signed their confidence and supply agreement with the New Democrats. We've also seen some new developments in the Conservative leadership race as the candidates uh, start to attack each other. So to discuss all the latest in federal politics, I'm joined this week by the CBC's Erin Wary and Spree Devetti. She is the Director of Policy and Engagement at the Center for Media Technology and Democracy and Senior Counsel for Enterprise Canada. Hello to both of you. Hi. Hey. Um, so Erin, we are a week after the budget. There's been a little bit more time to digest it, to think of what it all means. Um, what do you think it all means? And I, I think it comes down to kind of two, uh, the government's sort of thinking or, or, or objectives here were kind of twofold. One is to, to, to sort of re-engage or more seriously engage with the housing conversation. Uh, that is, I think, quickly getting ahead of them if it isn't already well past them. Uh, I, so I think that was sort of the first piece of it. And I think the second part is to deal with the economic growth discussion, which was maybe also getting away from them in that you had lots of people in the business community uh, and lots of readers of the Globe and Mail saying, you know, this government doesn't have an economic growth plan. Uh, where's the economic growth plan? And, you know, a lot of times when people say that, what they mean is why aren't you cutting taxes for business and, and doing more to help business? And I think the government sort of came at the conversation in a slightly different way by, you know, talking about innovation and, and wanting to fund innovation and, and do things like that. So, but I think this is their, I mean, I think this is them kind of trying to come at that conversation and get into it and deal with it rather than sort of let it fester. So I think those are kind of the two pieces sort of going forward to see where they get. I don't know that they've necessarily solved either of them with this budget, but I think this budget is kind of a first piece of getting at those two conversations. Sabria, what's your takeaway? Yeah, I'd agree with a lot of that. I would say that if you ask me for my like elevator take or really quick take of the budget, it's like a roadmap to get to a plan to some of the things that, you know, Aaron sort of highlighted there. And the other thing that really jumps out at me is that we're only really a week out from the budget. And yet it seems to have faded away from like the overall discourse, right? I think the rate hike that happened this week is sort of um, overtaken at least in, in more fiscal egghead-like circles, right, um, from, from the budget. And then with the conservative leadership race, you know, continuing to go on, and you already alluded to this in your intro, but like them lobbing bombs at one another and, you know, actual bombs that are still being dropped in Ukraine. Um, there's just so much stuff that's still going on. Uh, a new highly transmissible subvariant that's now been found in, in New York State, right? Like there's just so much that I feel like um, it's hard to really dig down into the ginormous document that is always the budget, but you know, it just doesn't seem to have garnered the same amount of post-budget attention that it normally does. So does that mean it's not really the big kind of event or the big you know, kickstart for this last term for the government? Or this this current term, I shouldn't say it's already the last term, uh, but you know, a fourth term's hard to win. But Sabria, does this mean that it was just kind of a no. not that big of a, a moment? No, I mean, I, I don't think so. I just think that like, given what's going on in the world, you can forgive people for perhaps not giving the budget the same amount of tension that it had, it would have received in like, you know, the before times or mm. even in the not right now times, right? Like, um, I think even a year ago when we're not dealing with um, World War Three and other highly transmissible variants, um, you get a little bit of a, a different reaction. Yeah, I guess against war and pandemic, the budget's pretty low on the priority list. Uh, but Aaron, do you think that, you know, if you were looking at this budget a year or two ago, it, would it have been a big surprise then? Is it is it not a it's not a watershed moment or anything like that? I don't know that it's a it's a watershed moment. I mean, part of the problem for the for the government in a weird way is that our sense of proportion is completely out of whack now. Yeah. Right. So they can announce ten billion dollars for something. And that sounds like a rounding error uh, compared to what they were spending during the pandemic. And so I think there's a bit of, uh, it's like reverse sticker shock. We no longer are surprised by big sums of money. And so I think that's part of it. I think that to a certain degree that helped them with this budget because you had lots of people writing that this was a, a budget of restraint and prudence, even though they're running a, you know, whatever, $50 billion deficit. Uh, but I, I, I think it's, you know, it's not a, it's not a kind of 
uh, I don't know that this is a big budget that people are going to look back on in, in 15 years and say that it really turned the tide, but I think it's more about starting to kind of push some things forward. And, and then I, I don't know that the budget itself will be looked at so much as the results, you know, uh, uh, a lot now depends on where housing prices are in two years, where, you know, economic growth is in two years, where inflation is in two years. And, you know, if those problems are still persisting in two years, this budget mm -hmm. might be looked at as a missed opportunity. But if, if, if those problems have sort of abated to a certain degree, this budget might be part of, of kind of fixing those things. Yeah. Supriya, do you see any fingerprints from the Liberal NDP deal in this? Would this budget have happened either way? I mean, arguably, I think it would have likely happened. I don't think that's, yet, that's what the NDP would like to hear. Um, but I think the biggest sort of piece is obviously the uh, dental care piece that's in the budget. But what's interesting about that is that it was mentioned um, in like the 2019 speech from the throne. So it's not as though it was totally off the liberal r radar, right? I think the NDP can hold their, you know, their, their chin up and basically say that, yeah, well, we, we got them to that point. But if you were listening to some of the Ottawa, you know, bubble whispers or whatever, the budget was originally supposed to be delivered on like April 6th or something. And it's not as though the supply and confidence agreement really shifted that, that budget date. So it's not like they went back to the drawing board completely and like started to retool the budget. They basically kept the same sort of time frame, you know, postponed it by maybe like 24 or 48 hours or whatever it was. And then, and then this is the budget that we have. So I, I think depending on what side you want to spin it on, you could spin it positively for, for either party. But I think dental care is, is arguably the, the biggest piece in there that the NDP can say, yeah, we did that. Right. Like they can't suddenly rewrite a budget in a week, right? It's, yeah, uh, it yeah, takes a lot exactly. of work. They already had the printing for the big books, I assume, already done, right? Yeah. Aaron, do you think that the NDP... Uh, handled itself well out of this? Because in a way, it was strange, right? We're in this new era with um, this agreement between the Liberals and the New Democrats. But on Budget Day, you still had Jagmeet Singh coming out saying that this was enough for him to support it. If the, the agreement didn't exist, it doesn't seem like it would have been any different in terms of how the NDP would have handled itself here. Yeah, so the NDP's caught in, in a pretty novel situation in that we just don't have a lot of examples of, of opposition parties being in these arrangements and then, uh, but not being part of government. And, and so we don't really know how opposition parties are supposed, are supposed to handle themselves in these situations. And so the NDP keeps doing this kind of awkward dance of saying, well, look what we got out of it. Look what we're doing. Look how we're constructive. But by the way, this government's terrible, and it's terrible in the following ways. And uh, it, it's, you know, to a certain degree, that happens in every minority parliament. Parties go out and say, this government is terrible, it's awful. And then the reporters say, so why don't you defeat them? And they go, well, you know, Canadians don't want an election right now. So maybe we'll find a way to keep them in power. And the NDP arrangement is arguably preferable to what the Liberals did during the Harper years when the Liberals sort of tripped over themselves to condemn the government and then not show up for votes and then try to explain themselves. And yeah, it, but don't you, know, you remember arguably, Aaron Ignatiev said that he was putting them on notice? Yeah, that's true. He did put them on <laughs> notice. And, and that really hurt Stephen Harper's feelings, if I recall correctly. Uh, and, uh, you know, they were very worried, I'm sure, in conservative circles. So, you know, the NDP is, is playing this as well as they can. I mean, again, I think that sort of expectations got ahead of people. There was a lot of like, oh, well, the, the Liberals have signed up with the NDP now, so we're going to have socialism. And it ended up being a kind of like, you know, $5 billion extra added to the budget for dental care. Uh, and so people kind of went, oh, well, that's it. And, you know, so I think people need to kind of calibrate their expectations. I mean, if, if the NDP can come out of this and say, we got dental care done, we got a few other things done, they'll have something constructive to say. It just might not be, you know, full-blown socialism. Yeah, Supriya, do you think it was a good or a bad kind of week for the NDP? I think it was an okay week for the NDP. Again, I think like if you wanted to really hammer them, and it, certainly the Conservatives did by basically saying that, you know, they needed to enter phylum cordata, aka get a spine, and, you know, really stand up to the Liberals if they're um, going to be saying that it's 
you know, they could have done more, but I, I honestly, like they're, they're in a tough spot. Like, again, Canadians don't want their election, number one. And number two, all of this stuff that I mentioned before, right? World War Three, pandemic, like inflation, housing prices, like you have a, an entire generation, um, including my own, even though I'm a geriatric millennial, but like, you know, millennials that are like my age and younger, it's impossible to own a home unless you're the descendant of homeowners already and your homeowning parents can front you money to help weather the shock of like a down payment. And if you're in the city of Toronto, then a land transfer payment, like it's just, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And I think we're, we're getting to a point where there are some serious problems we're going to be facing down the road. Um, and you know we're going to need actual solutions instead of just simply roadmaps to get to plans to eventually convene a roundtable to then deliberate on the solutions. Yeah, well, let's segue then and sort of combine <laughs> the two next topics with the conservative leadership race and this issue that the liberals are tackling. You've seen Pierre Poilievre come out with that video of him uh, in front of a, a, a house in Vancouver that was going to be sold for millions of dollars and using it as an example of people being priced out. He has some solutions with, um, some people have said are, are kind of unworkable solutions or simplified solutions that go beyond the federal government's jurisdiction. But we've seen other candidates come forward with housing policies. Um, so it, Aaron, this seems like this is both an issue within the conservative leadership race and a big issue that the government has to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I think that Pierre Polyev is, I mean, he's not, uh, he's a smart guy. And I think he realizes that there are lots of people who are frustrated with the price of housing and, and what's happened to it, particularly over the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, uh, economic concerns are, are a catnip for conservatives. And uh, it's a chance for him to, you know, blame big government and, and the Bank of Canada and, and government spending and you know, you can, we can spend an, another hour picking apart his arguments and explaining why they don't quite add up. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, as long as he's tapping into real anxiety or real frustration, he's got something that's potentially potent there. And, you know, to, to sort of link this back to the Liberal NDP deal, the Liberals do now at least have, in theory, three years to fix this issue. But, uh, I think it's pretty clear that if they don't get some progress on this issue, if housing prices keep going up, uh, if, if frustration continues to mount, that the, that the Conservatives, Pierre Polyev, potentially as leader, is going to have a pretty potent issue in the campaign. Uh, and it, you know, Colin Horgan, a friend of mine who, who used to work for Trudeau, actually wrote a piece today that, that compared affordability, the new affordability concern with the, the middle class concern that, that Trudeau care and the liberals carried in 2015. And I think there's something to that, that if, you're, if you've kind of put your finger on some sort of general frustration with the cost of living or, or your ability to get ahead or your ability to pay the bills, that you, you've got something you can build on, especially against a government that's been in power for a while and hasn't seemed to, to wrestle it to the ground. And so, you know, I do think, you know, a lot can happen in three years, but it's very possible that, you know, we're now seeing the sort of shape of that 2025 uh, election campaign right now. It's a period, do the Liberals have a good rejoinder to Pierre Poilievre and the kind of message he has around this issue? Short answer, no, but that's because I don't think one necessarily exists, um, at least when it comes to the trying to get already upper middle class younger folks into homes, right? Like a lot of what's been proposed and a lot of what has been, not just by the liberals, but I'm saying, you know, by concurrent sort of political parties that have tried to address this issue, particularly at the federal level, um, you know, we keep talking about home ownership and not about like increasing rental stock um, or not making renting a little bit more easy to do. We're not talking about like who actually owns real estate, right? In, in, in Canada, like in Ontario, for example, there's an outsized percentage of folks who own all property that, that, that there is from like a, a minority of people, a third of the liberal cabinet, according to Global News, has either rental or investment properties that they then have. So it's really hard to, you know, position yourselves as like the champions of trying to get folks into homes if you're also then sort of part of the problem. And I think, you know, it's what's really been interesting to me is that if from the last, I don't know, like six, seven years or so, 
there's no way you would have heard the conservatives talking about housing the way Pierre is right now, um, because the conservatives would have just said, oh, you're just a bunch of whiny millennial kids, um, just drive out further. Like, so what? You, so you want to live in downtown, you know, elite Toronto on, on Queen or what, like off of Queen Street. Um, just, you know, drive out to Barrie or drive out to wherever, like in the suburbs where I am in Oakville, like or go further. And so it's the problem, of course, is that even those houses in Barrie or even those houses in like Milton or, you know, pick your spot in the greater GTA, um, those are also unaffordable and increasingly, you know, smaller um, cities across not just the center of the universe here in Toronto, but like, you know, across uh, the country are, it's getting harder and harder to afford and like, you know, rents are getting harder and harder to afford as well. And so there's this whole, I think, paradigm shift that we need to um, start talking about housing in a different way. It's not just like, if, when you have a mortgage, you're an adult, like you're an adult because you're an adult, not because you have a mortgage or you owe the bank money or whatever. Like, um, and, you know, other jurisdictions have done this. Um, we haven't. And that's because housing kind of props up our economy in this weird way. And so we are in a position where we all recognize there's a problem, but to fix that problem means people will lose out on like the kind of fake money that's like in their houses. And I, fake money, I mean like paper money, right? Like not actual tangible money that you can pull out and then do things with. So I don't know, it's, 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 it's not as easy as, as certainly um, political parties would like to make it seem. Um, but then again, nothing ever is. This seems though like a big issue for the next general election, assuming things continue that way. I mean, we'll see where inflation is. If it is in three, four years, uh, the next election, inflation might be down to um, you know, levels that are more recognizable. Who knows? Maybe they're even worse. Maybe things have gotten worse by then. Let's not uh, predict the future. But <laughs> in terms of Poiliev, um, he's in the midst of a leadership race. And you just kind of mentioned it. This isn't the normal kind of conversation or the kind of rhetoric that you'd hear from a conservative uh, party leader. So who's he talking to here? Is he signing up new people into the conservative party with, you know, a video about real estate in, in the Vancouver area? I mean, maybe, maybe it's new people, but I think there are enough people that are frustrated within conservative circles with housing prices that he's already talking to like just the frustrated masses out there right like if you're younger and you can't afford a home you're pissed and if you're older and your kid can't afford a home or you know whatever 10 20 30 thousand that you can help to pay for your kid um get into for a down payment isn't enough then you're pissed it's like there's just a lot of pissed off people um that are that are anxious and worried about the future and he's tapping into that you know quite well but aaron the I mean, I, I suppose there would be those people who do have children trying to get into the uh, into the market, but the Conservative Party membership is not is probably predominantly mortgage holders. Let's just put it that way. Um, so, you know, we we are still seeing these huge crowds for Pierre Poliev. So he's definitely apparently tapping into something, bringing these people out. So, what do you make about that? What do you make of that? I mean, I think if you're Poliev and part of the potential argument against your candidacy for leadership was or is that you're, uh, you know, you're popular with the party base, but you can't really expand beyond that. There's probably something to be said for showing that you can make arguments beyond the party base and that you can tap into, uh, into things that, uh, you know, maybe non-traditional conservative voters or suburban voters are worried about. Uh, so there's, I think there's something to that. I mean, I think the crowds that he's drawing, I suspect are set. I don't know that the crowds he's drawing are anything more than the conservative base, but uh, it sure helps to show that you can rally and get that much enthusiasm. Uh, you know, people are throwing around comparisons to Trudeau in 2012 and 2013, and there are some big differences between the two, but, you know, I don't think that's entirely, uh, that's an entirely irrelevant comparison. Like, I, I do think that they're, you know, showing that kind of momentum and that kind of enthusiasm is probably pretty key. Now, we don't know, I mean, I don't know what Jean Charest and Patrick Brown are doing, and maybe they're doing all sorts of things that uh, are signing up members and, and quietly putting themselves in good position to win this. I, you know, I, I don't, I couldn't possibly guess, but uh, for, for Polyev, the, just the simple pictures of him with huge crowds, I suspect is is massive. You know, that's another thing that Trudeau had in in 2012 and 2013 was 
images and pictures and uh, that built into a sense of enthusiasm. And, you know, Trudeau was never really in any danger of losing that leadership race, but, you know, it added to, it added to a sense of, of him, of excitement around him and enthusiasm. And, and I suspect that's what Polio is going for here. One of the big differences between that race and this one is 15 bucks, right? To sign up to be a member of the leader of the Conservative Party, you need a $15 membership fee. Whereas back in 2012, 2013, um, uh, it wasn't, that wasn't how members could be brought in. You could just be a supporter of the party. It's not how they had over 300,000 members at the time. Uh, but if you're the Liberal Party, Supriya, and you see these crowds, do you say to yourself, just the Conservative base, these people were never going to vote for us anyway, we don't need to worry? Or do you think you look at this and say, okay, this is going to be tougher in 2025 or whatever than O'Toole, um, you know, in a studio in, in the Western Hotel in Ottawa? Look, if you're a liberal right now that's in government and you're looking at those crowds and thinking about 2025, I'm going to tell you to get off Twitter and do your damn job because 2025 is still a bleep long time away from now. Um, but I think if you're looking at those crowds and you're looking at some of the chatter that's happening, I mean, of course, but like, I don't know where this sort of discourse started where everybody thinks Pierre can't win. Like I haven't talked to a single liberal who doesn't think Pierre, uh, you know, can't win either the, the leadership or in a general, like, of course he can. Like, you know, dude's been around in politics for a very, very long time. He's clearly smart. He clearly knows how to tap in, not just into frustration and the anxiety that, you know, both Aaron and I were sort of touching on, but he really knows how to do the wink and the nodding and the nudging to some of the more uncertainty savory elements of the conservative base, but he does it in a way where he's not fully yet tarnished with like the Maxim Bernier brush, right? Like, so it, anyway, like, it's just, it's been really interesting to me, but, but to hear a lot of the chatter be like, well, for those who say Pierre can't win, like, look at these crowds. And I'm like, no, it's fucking saying he can't win. Like, so like, what are we talking about here? Um, of course he can win, but if you're a liberal, like, you know, keep your head down, do your job and we'll worry about it in 2025. Yeah, I mean, I've I've always thought he was the front runner, and I'm not sure if anybody, if if someone thought he wasn't the front runner, I'd like to know who they thought was the front runner. Um, speaking of people who probably aren't the front runner, Jean Charest has uh, recently decided that he's going to, you know, get his elbows up, actually start attacking the other candidates. Because I think in his first week he said he was going to leave the attacks to other people. Now he's decided he's going to do it himself. Uh, so he's gone after Poiliev on the Freedom Convoy on blockchain. Um, Aaron, this sounds like the Shore campaign has decided maybe we need to have some sort of energy in this campaign because otherwise, um, not really sure what we're doing here. Yeah, I mean, I it's good to see that that he's actually going to try to win this race. Um, I, like, yeah, I mean, I, to one extent, it is probably going negative, is probably a sign of, of weakness or vulnerability, uh, from Shore. On the other hand, I mean. Pierre Polly have rained hellfire down upon him uh, as soon as he even showed any interest in the race. And so unless Chere, unless, unless it was going to be a cakewalk and, and people were going to, were going to flood to Chere, he was going to have to fight at some point. He was going to have to actually campaign and, and try to win this race and try to actually win an argument with Polyev. So I, I mean, I, I, I guess maybe it made sense to wait and see how things uh, go. I mean, the problem with, waiting and then going negative as people wonder what changed and what, why are you doing this now? And uh, it can look a little desperate, uh, but I, you know, if, if the other guy is, is, is throwing bombs, uh, unless you're in a really, really good place, uh, you're gonna have to fight back at some point. And, uh, it, and, and it will be interesting to see how well Polyev holds up and responds to those. I don't know that these attacks that Sheree is making are really enough to cost Polyev the leadership, but uh, I suspect they're at least a preview of what the liberals uh, and others will say about Polyev if he becomes leader. I'm sure the Polyev campaign would love to hear that Sheree is uh, deploying the liberal attack lines already. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Supriya. I'm, I'm sure that what I just said will be clipped for a future Polyev attack. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, um, you know, Sheree seems to be reaching out to people who would be thinking that, yes, the Conservative Party needs to be a responsible national party and get its act together and all that kind of thing. So people 
who probably aren't members of the party, but I, I have a hard time imagining a lot of energy on the side of uh, let's be let's be reasonable versus the side of aren't you really angry about all of this that Poliev is currently wielding? Yeah, I mean, let's be angry about this always wins over the let's be reasonable, particularly in like a campaign sort of environment. Um, reasonableness doesn't, you know, motivate people to the same degree as like anger or anxiety, or even on the other side of things like hopey and changiness, right? Like you need a motivating factor and like calm, even keeled isn't necessarily something that's going to motivate folks. But what is interesting, I think, is that, um, you know, for all the reasons that Aaron sort of laid out there uh, for Charette to start, you know, punching back or, or what have you, is the Charette childcare announcement that sort of came out this week. And when Patrick Brown said that he also, you know, would um, be keeping those uh, liberal uh, provincial deals in in place that the liberals have struck up with all the provinces now. Um, Patrick Brown didn't actually mention Sheree or, or criticize his own uh, plank. So it's it's clear that both of them are kind of vying for at least that reasonable or or more moderate vote where you know Pierre is on the other side of things. Um, but I, I also just I, I'm I'm going to be very it'll be really interesting to see once you get into some of the more substantive policy conversations how Pierre is going to go about like. Like once people have a reduction in their childcare bill, like you can't take that back, right? Like that's very hard to do. So if he's saying he's going to cancel all those deals, like what does that mean for families down the line? If he's saying he's like, you know, anti the government subsidized dental care, well, it's wildly popular, even with people that, you know, have their own insurance. Like it's wildly popular amongst Canadians to be providing dental care for folks who cannot, you know, afford it themselves through their own private insurers or what have you. So like, these are aspects that I think will maybe bite him in the butt down the road, but for now he's kind of skating because, you know, we're talking about crowds and we're not really talking about policy. Chere and Brown will have a chance to put that to Poiliev in May. There's going to be two debates, one in English in Edmonton, I think it was on the 11th, and then one in French in Montreal on the 25th. So we'll see how they do this actually in person versus, you know, over media, over Twitter, over social media. Um, but you mentioned Brown, uh, and I, I'm starting to think that the Brown campaign is going to be um, um, even a bigger factor than I already thought it was, it was going to be. I didn't think they were you know, running, running fifth, but we saw the Poiliev campaign come out with a complaint about the fraudulent memberships that's coming from, they didn't explicitly say, but they implied it was coming from the Patrick Brown campaign. Um, I, I'm not sure if Poiliev was thinking he's winning this on the first ballot and all that, that he, Sapria would be all that worried about Patrick Brown yeah. signing up a few extra members. Well, it's like, you always have to be <laughs> somewhat worried about the guy who's quiet and you don't really know what they're up to right to Aaron's point like we don't really know what Brown is up to um and given what he was able to pull off in the PC leadership race right a, a few years ago in, in Ontario I mean he kind of just came up through the middle and was able to sign up a bunch of new members uh dude is able to somehow go to like a fundraiser a fun run uh you know a, a, like a wine and cheese, a barbecue, like all in the same day, even though we all have 24 hours in a day, but Patrick Brown manages to do it all. And I think he does also have, you know, being from uh, the, the mayor of Brampton, he obviously has, you know, inroads within various uh, aspects of the South Asian community that are already, you know, big uh, supporters of his that will obviously help him uh, reach out to uh, you know, folks who maybe weren't members before of the Conservative Party or are still a little bit pissed off about the Barbaric Cultural Practices Act or the, or, you know, the Harper Niqab stuff back from 2015. Um, you know, the conservatives rallying uh, for weirdly against a motion to condemn Islamophobia, you know, in, in 2017, like there's a lot of baggage that the conservatives hold um, that Patrick Brown doesn't because when, you know, not only as PC um, leader, but as mayor of Brampton, he's been championing um, a lot of the issues that are you know, quite near and dear to folks that aren't white, um, particularly within the South Asian community um, or, you know, the Muslim community. Um, and so I, I think it's, it, that'll be interesting. And um, again, like the proof will be in the pudding, I suppose, but you, you have to be worried about a guy like Brown.
Yeah, you look at the crowds, uh, you know, we're talking about crowds again, but you look at the crowds that Poliev is, is bringing out and the crowds that Brown is meeting, they're very different, not just in size. As you mentioned, he's meeting people from the South yeah. Asian community, from Muslim communities. And you can imagine that he might be able to, you know, tap into those networks in a way that a group of people who don't know each other yeah. attending a big rally in Calgary are not going to be working together. It, it, there, there does seem to be the chance that for Brown, he's tapping into a uh, potential membership base that the other candidates are not even trying to reach. And it makes me think that Brown could become one of these uh, candidates is really surprising. So when on election, well, uh, when we get the results, if he has been kind of nice to Sheree during this campaign and Sheree finishes fourth, because let's be honest, that's possible he finishes behind Les and Lewis, suddenly Brown's a real, yep. real factor here because he could get a lot of the Lewis support because of his position on religious freedom. Like, Aaron, maybe the Patrick Brown campaign is the one that we should be talking about a little bit more. Yeah, I, Supriya mentioned the leader, the PC leadership race in Ontario that Brown won. And I think that's a good, like, that's a good point of reference because when he left federal politics to run provincially, it, there was a bit of surprise. Like he was a backbencher in the Harper uh, Conservatives and not a particularly like well-known or, or prominent backbencher. And then suddenly he wins. Uh, and so he's clearly got some ability to surprise. And, and to the point you made earlier about, you know, the $15 membership fee, for all the crowds that Pierre Polly is putting together, we really don't know how many members he's signing up out of those crowds. Uh, how many names he's getting uh, that will, you know, go out and vote for him in a few months or in several months. And it's entirely possible that Patrick Brown is, is, is you know, by going to smaller crowds and, and going uh, to specific meetings and signing up just as many, if not more new members than Pierre Polyev is. So it's, you know, there's a lot of noise out there right now, and it's hard to know exactly what it's going to add up to. And you know, if Patrick Brown is half the organizer, he seems to be, yeah, there's a, there's at least a chance that he uh, it gives Pierre Polyev uh, a serious run for his money. Now, I, I would still, my guess from the start has kind of been that Pierre Polyev wins this on the second ballot. Uh, and I don't know that I've seen a lot kind of uh, out in the open to change my mind on that. But in leadership races, you really can't know what's going on there with a ton of specificity until the ballots come back. And then you get a real sense of, oh, okay, here's where we're at. Yeah, it, we, what about do you think, it's great to start with you, now that we've been a little bit further into this race, does it feel, because at the beginning it felt like this was a race that could split the party in two and who knows what happens after that. Do you feel like that cha has changed at all uh, now that we're you know, a month and a half into this? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I ever believed that it was going to split the party in two, only because if the party was going to split in two, like, like they would have just done it already, right? <laughs> like, there are enough, like, tensions or whatever that, that have existed within the modern day conservative party since its, you know, formation, really. And they always seem to be able to get their act together prior to an election. And I would imagine that that would, irrespective of whatever infighting was happening right now, that they'd be able to, to, to do the same. But I think what's definitely happened is that with the deal between the liberals and the NDP, it at least gives the conservatives some breathing room, right? Like they don't now have to get their stuff together right away so that they can prepare for an election. Like they, they can, you know, sit down, formulate some policy, really figure out what, where the liberals, where the liberals weaknesses um, are. And also, you know, maybe try and come up with a few lines that aren't totally centered on their hatred for Trudeau himself. Right. Because um, in, in 2025, it's a long time from now, a lot can change. I know that the prime minister has said that he's going to, you know, be leading the party into the next election. Let's see what happens um, then. But it's very clear that the conservatives need to move away from just visceral hatred of Trudeau into substantive alternatives as to what they're offering the conservatives. And the one thing that I will say about, um, you know, Pierre um, versus an O'Toole, let's say, is that Pierre is who he is, right? Like you can hate him or you can love him, but he's authentic. Um, Aaron O'Toole, you know, he kind of made himself into this weird caricature of this true blue candidate for the leadership race. And then, you know, pivoted back to his like more moderate um, centrist self for the general and like members were rightfully pissed off. So I think at least with the Pierre led conservative party, 
um, the conservatives can't really say, well, oh, we got duped or they, he did the old switcheroo on us. Um, so at least if they, you know, go forward with Pierre, they know what they're getting. Aaron? Yeah, I don't, look, all the incentives are always on the side of uh, the party sticking together, right? If you want to win power, you're better off staying together. And if, you know, most of these people want power, they're probably going to stick together. Uh, that said, I do wonder about, this is the most negative, not that I've been around for a hundred years, uh, but this is the most negative leadership race I've, I've ever seen. And I do wonder how those attacks back and forth kind of work themselves out afterwards. I'm, I wouldn't, I don't know that I can see the party breaking up with Polyev as leader, he, you know, unless he, unless he really tacks to the right and there's some kind of moderate group of conservatives that decides they just can't be around the party anymore and they leave. Uh, maybe that happens, but I, I think the bigger, the bigger split, if there was going to be a split, it'd be more likely to happen because someone like Brown or Charest somehow pulled off an upset victory and uh, the Polyev side, uh, which had spent, you know, months uh, dropping bombs on these people, suddenly uh, found itself on the outs. I would wonder what happens in that scenario. But, you know, I understand why people talk about it. It's, you know, obviously the party's broken up in the past and it's fun to talk about dramatic things happening. But uh, I, all things considered, it's more than likely that this party heads into the next election in, in you know, more or less intact. Okay. Well, that's kind of dull, Aaron, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's probably going to cut into your pages. Aaron. Yeah, it's, it's Can Canadian politics. What is it? It's, it's, it's boring. Uh, it's usually boring, so we'll see uh, if it gets more dramatic. But anyway, uh, you know, this is going to be a race to follow for a long time uh, for the rest of the summer. There's going to be the Ontario election, which I think is probably going to have some impact on some of these things in terms of uh, how that's going to play out. Um, so there'll be plenty more to talk about. And uh, I really appreciate you both coming on today to chat about the latest. And uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks to Aaron and Sapria for that discussion. And as always, if you like this video, I hope that you'll subscribe to this YouTube channel. I'll be posting some new things over the next few weeks, especially with the Ontario election just around the corner. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.